I almost killed everybody in the masjid. I got to build the suspense. You really want to know? I got to... <laughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, salat as rasulillah. Um, welcome back to Imam Talk, and we have here an esteemed guest that needs no introduction, uh, Shaykh Muhammad al-Shanawi. Ahlan wa sahlan. Welcome. Uh, someone that I have benefited from tremendously. And I don't know if you re recall, do you remember the first time I met you? You it probably don't. Mass? You probably don't know. Okay. It wasn't mass. Let me know. It was at John Jay College in... 2012, I want to say. Allahu yeah, I drove up with John Starling, with Sheikh John, to catch one of your talks. And uh, he was driving the Buick 94 Park Avenue that I bought, I bought from him that I still have. Uh, so we rode up and we caught one of your lectures and we just had you know very, very, very brief introduction afterwards. You had to go somewhere. But a lot has passed since that meeting, you know. Uh, a lot of white hair since then. A lot of white hairs on both sides, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. trips abroad to study and, and things like that. So one of the things that we do for Imam Talk is to give people a sense of what did your path to leadership in the Muslim community look like? Because there's not just one way. There's a lot of different ways. And what sort of lessons can we take from your from your path to leadership? Even considering myself till this day uh, a leader is very daunting, to be honest. Uh, you know, even before leadership, I uh, I remember being enamored, as many people are, with the stories of people who sort of uh, reform overnight and repent overnight. Uh, and I had left the masajid for a short period of my life. Uh, my prayers had interrupted. Um, and I used to always wonder, like, what changed? Why am I back? How did I get back here? Mm. And I don't have a story, I used to always tell myself. And then I, I sort of just gave myself closure after years of, like, wishing I had this, you know, dramatic uh, change of heart. Uh, and I just said, you know what? Maybe it was that slow and that gradual because Allah knows if I had, like, a a big splash moment, or uh, maybe I would have got a little full of myself and it would have been all pointless. Uh, and then after sort of I accepted uh, that I wouldn't be able to identify it, Allah started sending me people in my life to point out for me things, not even reminding me. Some of it was reminding me like, you know, your dad would never leave any stone unturned without helping this place and that place. And subhanAllah, I never made the connection. Allah had just hidden that from me. My father, uh, rahimahullah, may Allah have mercy on him, wasn't in the scholar space. Uh, he didn't have much Quran at all under his belt, but there was never like a, an avenue of khair, mm. of, you know, the uh, not so glamorous leadership, right? Mm. The behind the scenes leadership, except that he was a part of it. Uh, opening masajid, Islamic schools, uh, even beyond that. That's profound because a lot of people are under the impression that you need to be a scholar or in the scholarly milieu in order to impact, especially masajids specifically, or the Muslim community generally. And, uh, you know, the phrase, you know, be that basic Muslim, right? Maybe your, your father was a, a, a type of a quote unquote basic Muslim that was able to have a tremendous amount of influence. And that was something they called my attention to that I could vaguely recollect like, oh, yeah, you know. But there was even aspects of things my mother told me way past the time that I got into leadership spaces. And I couldn't recall for the life of me. She used to tell me, I don't know if I've ever shared this publicly, but that when we were uh, like struggling, trying to keep the business afloat, there's a short period when we uh, tried to uh, open a restaurant. MashaAllah. Uh, what type of food? It was like a pizzeria, okay. Mediterranean, yeah, yeah. kind of hodgepodge. In yeah, it. yeah. I've worked for some of those. <laughs> okay, I know exactly good. what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Taking a shot in the dark there and it eventually closed down. She tells me that she tried to help my dad. She would run the cashier and cook in the back and whatnot. And she used to tell us stories of like the seven under Allah's shade. And I would get all emotional when she mentioned the youth that was raised up in the worship of Allah. And I'm like, no, I wasn't. I would not cry at five years old about something like that. And she she swears that I did. I say, Ya Allah, like, you know that ayah in, uh, in At-Tur, uh, when Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَاتَّبَعَتْهُمْ ذُرِّيَتُهُمْ بِإِيمَانٍ أَلْحَقْنَا بِهِمْ ذُرِّيَتَهُمْ 
those who believe and then their progeny follows them in faith, that's the qualifier, we will let their progeny catch up with them. Think about that like there's a there's a there's a gem there, right? Like a subtlety uh, that what do you mean your their progeny will catch up with them? Why can't it be the other way around? Because there's really no way around it. Yeah. Yeah. You will never one up them when the inner workings, that's what was sort of my conclusion. The inner workings, stuff I don't even remember. The underground that edged me perhaps in a certain direction by Allah's permission, uh, they'll always be ahead, right? And by Allah's permission, you know, the children will somehow be reunited with their parents, though they can never make up that ground. You know, you mentioned like a interregnum, like a, a period of break with your prayer. What what age around was that? Like, was that teenage years? Like fifth to eighth, fifth to ninth grade. You know what it was? My father was very involved in the masjid, principal of the Sunday school. He managed the uh, the reselling of like uh, plots in the graveyard and all that stuff. And so it could have been that, uh, age where I wanted to be anything but my dad could have also been a little bit uh, uh, too much passion a little bit too much forcefulness that you know just I ricocheted in the opposite end for a while uh, but yeah I drifted uh, I mean I definitely had that as well for me it was a little bit later like around 16 15 16 years old I was you know and that's you know I, there's a certain degree that's fairly typical right so, but then, okay, you found yourself reconnecting. It was a slow, gradual process. You know, how did that eventually put you on a path to leadership in addition to kind of like your forgotten heritage for what you kind of inherited from your father? Like, where did that start being applied or finding an outlet? So Allah is so kind, right? Like eighth, ninth grade, uh, the first youth center, the Mass Youth Center of Brooklyn, New York on Bath Avenue, that opens up. I had sort of uh, really been drawn to basketball at that point. A lot of youth gathering there. Basketball was a uh, a rallying point for us. They sat us down, taught us basic surahs, sirah, you know, and all of this. And, I mean, eventually Ramadan comes around. They want to show that they're producing, you know, uh, uh, glamorous youth. They write for me a half-page lecture. <laughs> <laughs> really? I memorize it word for word. So I get up in the fundraiser, like, and I and I, I give this spiel uh, about w how we are tomorrow and stuff. Uh, the youth are here, and the crowd goes wild, <laughs> and uh, people donate well, and so they start taking me around, uh, masjid to masjid, you're the cash cow. at night, you're you're the, the cash, cash cow, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm just repeating the same thing over and over again. Uh, people start thinking I know stuff, right? I don't even know just Amma at this point. Uh -huh. uh, and then, you know, so 9-11 happens in the middle of all of this. Mm. And so I, in hindsight, like Allah is a latif, right? So subtle. Uh, I was, you know, forced to step up mm. and either, you know, be a, a victim of my circumstance uh, because it's no longer socially convenient. It's not as easy to hide anymore. Or I'm going to be, as they say, a victor of my circumstance and try to say, hey, get on my back. Yeah, we're Muslim. And, I remember I wasn't the first one, but we said, you know what, we're wearing kufis to school. I've been public school my whole life. Okay. Uh, and alhamdulillah, Allah Azza made it easier for me, born in the States. I'm on the basketball team. So uh, we started wearing kufis to school and doing, you know, Muslim things and stuff. Uh, and I graduated from high school a few short years later. Still don't have much under my belt in terms of, you know, training and knowledge. And I'm, before I got to campus, people are reaching out to me that you have khutbah. First Friday Lasta. on campus. Lasta. And uh, I had never given a khutbah before in my life. And so uh, I remember clearly, you know, trying to prepare something from a lecture that I half understood in Arabic for a Kuwaiti scholar on uh, how much do you long for paradise. And I remember I was so nervous given the khutbah that I choked in the khutbah. Like, Literally choked. <laughs> <laughs> Mid-sentence a bunch of times. Uh, and, you know, things kept, you know, gradually progressing. One time I, I was in a, uh, a big masjid and I gave a khutbah and there was a major international scholar there. Mm -hmm. And I was attending throughout the week uh, some usul fiqh, uh, ijazah programs for him in New Jersey. And he attended the khutbah and he didn't understand a word from my khutbah, but he sort of just saw how people embrace someone who speaks good English, I guess, who can, right. you know, piece thing, a coherent I message guess. together. And yeah, he saw people approaching me and asking me questions that are way above my pay grade and stuff like this. But... And so he came to me and he said to me something very powerful. 
he said, Echi, Allah has chosen you for something that's either going to take you to the highest ranks in Jannah or and so I kind of said to him that's exactly why I don't want it I, I don't want this gamble uh, or something to that effect and he said to me Kun ma'al qadar. be with Allah's decree be content, accept it you're not chasing, you're not drooling after it, that's a good thing the fear of hypocrisy is what protected the Sahaba from hypocrisy. Keep that fear alive in you. Uh, but accept Allah's decree at the same time and make the best of it. And so I started realizing that whatever little bit of knowledge I had for myself may have been enough. But whatever knowledge I'm seeking now for the Ummah mm -hmm. will never be enough. Right? Even a lot won't be enough. So I went to Medina at some point in the interim, first semester. Alhamdulillah, I had Arabic under my belt. I sort of recalled the language of, of my parents to a considerable extent. I was able to test out of the uh, Ma'had, the Arabic seminary, and I went straight into College of Hadith. Fadlillah, I aced my first semester. Second semester, right before it started, my dad, rahimahullah, caught his, uh, his third stroke at that point. So I came back to Medina just to get the paperwork done for like a hopefully a short hiatus, tajil, and... Uh, I came back to America to take care of him. It was like about a three-year, very slow deterioration through Parkinson's and dementia and otherwise. May Allah make it a purification for him. And so I continued. Uh, I signed up for Mishkeh University. I hauled it out. I already had my second kid at that point, yeah. you know, but you know, it is, it's the front line's work. There's no backing out anymore. It is a collective fard on us to get into da'wah, but whoever identifies themselves or is identified as, then it becomes fard right? It's an individual duty on us. So it took me about eight years to finish Mishka, and I'm still learning on the job, hoping the job doesn't prevent me from learning. All of us. Now, there's a lot to, to take from, from your story. I mean, I think there's a narrative out there that, and a lot of people use this to gatekeep, right? that you have to be at a certain level in order to do anything, in order to open your mouth, right? And obviously there's a reason why that exists because you have your TikTok shakes. You have people that, you know, exactly the opposite of your scenario, somebody who's drooling after it, putting themselves in that position to speak when they don't belong in that position to speak. But there is also something to be said, exactly like, you know, the Sheikh said and, and that you pointed out for... Okay, the people who are reluctant, it's just like sulta, right? It's just like any position of uh, riyasa or, or leadership or anything. The people who are, what's, what's the saying? We've reached a time when, you know, those who should stay silent speak and those who speak should stay silent. And so it's almost like a paradoxical litmus test. It's like if you don't want it, that means you're... You're, you're, <laughs> it's yours, or at least it should be yours in an aspirational sense. You know, it's like a, a burden to bear, you know, and there's a responsibility to be had. But I mean, just like with, uh, you know, with the whole sort of, you know, people feeling maybe they're not sufficient for what they can pass on to their kids. There's also this sort of feeling, well, maybe I, I don't know enough to, to make, you know, I'm just pretending, you know, imposter syndrome and thing like things like that. And that's an important check for our humility, but at the same time, like it can also be the source of motivation to, okay, yeah, get up and give the khutbah, and you know you're not all that, but it's going to force you, and you said this before with, you know, in private conversation, that having the accountability of the leadership position forces you to develop yourself. It forces you to learn if you're halfway sincere. You, you don't want to do a bad job, right? And honestly, I'm... My father-in-law actually was attending a khutbah for me about maybe it's a few weeks ago. And my, my due to parking limitations, my masjid has two khutbahs, right? And so, obviously, it's the same khutbah twice. And so, after the first khutbah, I was upset at the framing of the discussion. Not content of really the same substance. I felt like it was all right. It wasn't overkill. I have a few checkpoints always in my head. But I didn't like the framing. I felt like it could have been better. So I'm reframing it in my notes, and he's looking at me like, what in the world are you doing? Like, you just gave khutbah. I was like, yeah, but I don't, I didn't like, you know, I like to respect the intelligence of people in front of me. I like this and that and third. And he's looking at me like, stop being silly. It was fine. I was like, no, you need to understand. I have been traumatized by khutbahs for 20, 25 years in my life. And 
it has actually made me sit through khutbas and say, I wish I was up there, right? Uh, and and I used to always wonder, like, what kind of monster am I? I, I want to be up there, right? I want to put myself in peril because the hadith says, being the center of attention is, is a slaughterhouse. Beware of these slaughterhouses. Uh, you think about that, like, celebrity is seen as, oh, man, why can't we be on stage? And why can't this? And why can't that? Like, I wish I could get off, right? I hope I wish that. I hope it's not just pretentious. But when you call it a slaughterhouse, and I'll get back to the point of, you know, my trauma, but how many animals survive entering the slaughterhouse? Almost none. That's the whole idea. Most people in the spotlight won't survive. But still, the, the khutbah is such a heavy responsibility uh, because you only have these people for 20 minutes. Maybe that's their only inlet to revitalizing their hearts and their connection with Allah all week. That that was a part of it as well. It truly, I felt after a while that it truly was a sense of uh, sympathy for the average Muslim and we had to do better. So it was that inner conflict between I don't want to be up there, but saying something has to get fixed here. Yeah, and it becomes duty at a certain point. You know, like the the person who's able to do it competently has a responsibility to step up. And it's kind of paradoxical because it's almost maybe it's more egotistical in some sort of way to hold yourself. Maybe that's like aloofness, right? To hold yourself back, even though you know that whatever's being put out there is insufficient, perhaps damaging. Right, and that you have the ability to actually intervene and, and make it better. Right, you may think there's a there's some sincerity there, but it's a facade. That's actually, if you want to know leadership or my story with it, that's actually why I became an imam. So I was like on the circuit, right, just speaking, were invited, and mm-hmm. and I felt like I was sincere because I don't, I never had a rate. I, you know, I almost never accepted money beyond expenses. You know, and this was for a long while. And the masjid that I voluntarily went to to revive their community or build it out once a month which is the current community I'm in now, Allentown, Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. uh, after a few years when my dad passed, they said, okay, look, you kept saying you can't move, you can't move, your dad. They left me, of course. They were very uh, considerate. Six months into it, they said, okay, now you got to come here and sort of build build this out with us firsthand. And I was like, no, man, I, I promised myself I'd never take money and I'd be sincere. And sell all this. out. Oh, you didn't want to sell out. Yeah. No. And then Dr. Hatsum al-Hajj, uh, uh, I consulted him after they kept pressing me and he said, Muhammad, listen. And I think that's the whole solution to your point, like the paradoxical situation. You need mentors, if not, then brothers, right? To keep each other in check, right? So important uh, to help you stay c- accountable. You can't always be the judge of yourself. Conflict of interest, right? <laughs> so I sat with him and I said, but I, Sheikh, I, I promised myself I'd never be an imam. I'd never be on payroll. Uh, he said, what do you think of the masjid? I said, to be honest, I've been to so many masajid and I've never seen management like this. I've seen them through conflict. I've seen them provoked in manners that are, you know, incredibly unfair. And they were always taking the higher road. They were always, you know, putting the interest of the collective above their own. I've seen that in ways I, I could never pull off myself. He says, okay, Muhammad. So listen, you may think you're more sincere because you don't want a paycheck, but you're only able to give on a volunteer basis. 10 hours a month. Why are you looking at it as I want to give 10 hours for free a month? Why are you not looking at it that I'm refusing to give them the other 110 hours a month? Sincerity is not doing what you like more, even if it's a religious objective. Sincerity is doing what's more pleasing to Allah and stepping up for you know the duty of the hour. I want to read Quran. I want to be in private. I want. To, I wish I could, right? But it's not about what you want. It's preferring Allah's pleasure over your own. So I, I sort of had to just take the dive. You know, he said to me, what else about leadership in that conversation? You're bringing it all back now, mashallah. He said, and I guarantee you, you will learn far more uh, from them, from serving them, than you will learn traveling around giving talks. And you will never change anyone's life overnight in a lecture. You may convince someone to want to change his life, but it, it's the it's the dirty work, right? It's getting into the the grassroots, building it out. You'll benefit from them more than they'll benefit from you. And man, he's been right. All right, well, let's get to that. So explain how that's been right. Because yeah. <laughs> I've got my own ideas. You know, when you talk about that, I mean, it, for me, it brings to mind when you're rooted in a community, uh, you can't keep up any facade or pretensions. They start to notice your flaws. 
and you know uh, anybody who's halfway decent they know their own flaws so now everybody <laughs> is aware but you're so public facing that your flaws are kind of put on a big screen in in some sort of way right um and it you- keeps you humble and it also kind of crushes you and it can lead to burnout and all these other sorts of things you know but there's something good going on there in, in the accountability. It's the village mentality, right? You know, everybody knows each other's business. That's not what the modern self wants. The modern self wants, you know, I have my privacy, I have my boundaries, and you stay over there, and I'll stay over here, and I'll meet with you on my terms when I want to, when I'm comfortable. But when you're the imam of a masjid, you know, and if you live next to the masjid, perhaps, <laughs> yeah, there's, that's not a possibility. Everybody knows your business. Yeah, that's that's a part of it. Uh, you can't you can trick some people some of the time, all the time, and you can trick uh, all people some of the time. You can't trick everyone forever, right? Uh, and then you think about what is the whole, what's the goal, right? The the goal is the goal a highlight reel. Let's imagine your life even was a highlight reel. Imagine you were flawless, as you know we try to portray online. Is you being flawless going to uh, impact others and change them. It won't. That's the very reason why angels were not sent and human messengers were. And so you realize after a while that if I want to impact these people for the better, I, I can't just be super impressive and interesting to them. Like even if it were possible and it's not, just this bizarre hypothetical that shaitan sort of slips into us sometimes and has us burning years of our life on it. You know, that's the Dale Carnegie premise, right? How to like win friends and influence people. The whole thesis of the of the the bestseller is that it's not about being interesting to people; it's about being interested in people, right? And so, to, as you often say, how to you know connect before you correct? How do I change this person's life? Oof, it takes a long time. I was in that community for four years, month in, month out. I think it was the first or second weekend of the month, khutbah, night program, all of that. Did nothing. Allentown, my current message. Uh, in the sense of like actually being able to be granted access, right, into their private life, access into their thoughts and, and beliefs. But when, you, when you're when you present and then they come to you, I actually timed it. How long before the youth open up to me? How long before people come to me? It took months and months and months before I know who has a substance abuse issue, who has a marital issue. Who, and not that I feel these or, uh, you know, cater to them firsthand, but just being seen as a place of trust to facilitate or help direct them to uh, worthy resources or you know places of better efficacy and specialization than myself. It took time, subhanAllah. It took so long. Uh, and I, I think that's a big part of it. I, I remember once texting Sheikh Hatim about this issue and, uh, and saying to him, I'm the bloody battered shepherd at this point. Allah. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. And he, and he told me, he's like, Muhammad, listen, uh, I want you to know for sure that more people appreciate and are making dua for you than you think, right? If you need a breather, you know, create space and, you know, rejuvenate and don't burn out because you're not doing anyone a favor. Uh, that's a big part of it, learning to be interested in people. You know, the, the, the burden and the patience required in like enduring harm from people, that's a big part of the imam role for sure. But the, the stamina, Right, not just withstanding blows that are initiated by others, the stamina to keep connecting with people and not allowing them to drift and not allowing things to get between you and to go to others and swallow their ego and say, listen, about that conversation yesterday, you're my brother no matter what. I don't care what you think about medhebs or anti-medhebs. I don't care what you think about vaccines or not. I don't care what you think about the right and the left of the political uh, spectrum. We are brothers no matter what. And the people that I even assumed were those who trusted me the most, I realized that it was an assumption years later. Not that they hated me or anything, but they're still, you know, it is moments of conflict that are moments of growth, right? Challenges and deadlocks that these things really happen. I had no idea. I mean, the, the stories are are plenty. When the masjid burned down, I'll share with you one. Uh, the new location, in hindsight, everyone's saying it's, you know, a perfect place. We 10 x and all that. Do we move away from the inner city where there's, you know, more uh, foot traffic, uh, core volunteers? But the the facility as a facility was leaps and bounds ahead. 
And so the board actually brought me over to see the place. And uh, they were sort of gauging reactions or trying to preempt, you know, any sort of fallout in the community. It was a turbulent time. We were homeless for about eight, nine months, or I didn't have the, didn't have our masjid. Uh, and I said to them, you know, pros and cons are, are pretty clear. And my advice to you is to reach out to the, the core team of volunteers and make sure they're appeased at least. And they're like, no, 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 we want to hear from you. What do you think? I was like, I, I told you. I mean, it seems to have some clear benefits if you guys choose to make that decision. But at the end of the day, I thank Allah that it's not my decision, it's yours. Uh, and he's like, wait, so you don't have a problem with it? I was like, it doesn't matter if I have a problem with it or not. We had an agreement before we started that I would not overstep and you also would leave a sphere of autonomy so that I feel like I can impart, you know, whatever Allah has endowed me of, a bit of leverage in a certain, you know, uh, scholastic space. And that's it. We have an agreement. He's like, so you're not going to cause a revolution in the message? <laughs> you're not going to pull a like, David and Goliath on us and sort of romanticize it? And so I could see it in his eyes. He actually, the president of the masjid, Allah bless him, he, he had to relocate. Uh, he grabbed me and tried to kiss me on the head. I didn't let him. But what I took from that is, oh my God, you were afraid of me. So we actually don't automatically have all that territory in people's hearts that we think as imams. It takes way more work than we think. Allah help us. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's amazing how long relation, I mean, leadership is all about relationships. That's, you know, one of the things that I've learned. It's not about qualifications. It's not about credentials or being even necessarily good at what you do, though that's part of it. That lends you credibility, but it's more than anything about relationships. And that's, you know, one of the things, you know, Sheikh Yasser, um, but Jess has me reading all these leadership books now. Um, and one of the things that you reminded me of, you know, something that's very counterintuitive to me. Um, but one of the books I was reading, it said that if a relationship goes cold or drops off or drifts away, a true leader takes responsibility for it, even if it's not your fault. And I was like, wow, that is so opposite to how I'm used to operating. Like, like you be the one to pick up the phone. You be the one to reconnect. And if we, you think enough about it, yeah, that's from our dean. You know, like that's about, you know, and, and who's the person? It's not just connecting with others when it's convenient for you it's, or when it's reciprocal. It's when the other person fades away and drops off. So, you know, tough lessons and things that are, that are you know, learned, you know, Shafi, through. Rahimahullah. When was it Yunus ibn Abdul A'la or another one of the not as Imam tier one as Imam Shafi'i? Uh, they disagreed over some issue. And th the next day, Shafi'i, which makes him a leader, right? <laughs> he reached out to him and said, Is it not possible that we remain as brothers even if we disagree on an issue? He initiated. You know, Sheikh, I have to give him credit, Sheikh Walid Basyuni. Hafidahullah. Uh, he, he did something with me recently that reminded me that he did the exact same thing, both to your point, like 15 years ago. So uh, there was a, uh, a certain uh, adjective he used uh, regarding a certain person that I kind of looked at, looked at him and I was just trying to understand what he said and I understood exactly what he said. But he walked out thinking that I interpreted it the wrong way, that I that he would be sort of like uh, throwing shade at, the, at a particular person. And so two days later, he was rushing for a flight. He sends me a long, you know, uh, explanation of how this adjective, you know, basically desiring fame can be for personal benefit and couldn't be for the sake of, you know, uh, giving the dean a greater platform and the scholars, you know, differed on should, you know, the the person of knowledge stand out in his attire and his narrative and with for certain reasons, hey, but right? And subhanAllah, he has it. Allah has granted it to him. And so he thought that I may have understood him as saying this guy's just, you know, uh, chasing clout. And I just looked at him because I disagreed with it in principle that he's not that kind of person, whether for the right reasons or for the wrong reasons. In any case, he sent me this long explanation uh, and he said, I'm, you know, I'm happy you didn't just swallow what I had to say because that means you have ghayrah for the sanctity of Muslims. And it was very beautiful. He goes, but by the way, what I said is not a negative. It is just extremely dangerous. 
to have that quality because you have to have a very high level of taqwa and private ibadah to survive that sort of approach of distinguishment, seeking distinguishment uh, for deen because it's a slaughterhouse. Uh, and so I, I'm sitting there reading it. It was a beautiful, I was like, Alhamdulillah, you misunderstood my look, Sheikh, because you know I've benefited so much from explanation, but the fact that you took the time out to make sure I was okay. And then I remember that 15 years ago, first time I ever met the Sheikh, I was sitting with him after Jumu'ah, other part of the world, and uh, there was a, an Usuli issue mentioned. And back in the day, I was just the Islam QA guy. That was my <laughs> sole source of information. And I said, Sheikh Al-Munajid, you know, Hafidahullah, Fakka Asra'un, said X, Y, and Z. And so Sheikh Khalid sort of like, uh, you know, he sort of like flipped his hand a little bit and, and stuff. Uh, and I kind of looked at him like, how could you? Like, right. this man has a website. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's on the that internet. That one, the look was real. The look was like, who does this guy think he is? Sheikh Walid. Oh, man. Allah forgive me. But I, it was just a look, though. Yeah. He caught it. And then I sat for a while and I had to slip away because my meter was running out. Uh -huh. And so I, I excuse myself, give salam to the sheikh, rush out. He calls the other brother in the car with me. Mashallah. And he says, number one, did you get a ticket? I really hope you didn't get a ticket. Mashallah. Number two, <laughs> I, don't, I really hope you don't think I meant X, Y, and Z about that sheikh. Me and that sheikh are boys. We Mashallah. grew up together. Wow. I have the utmost respect for Sheikh Al-Munajid. Wow. Mashallah. Uh, and so that's a leader, man. Like, who yeah. am I? Like, right. why even yeah. take the time out to, to figure out if, like, you know, arrogant Chanel is, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. So the shaitan plays with that stuff. And the leaders, I think, understand that. You know, subhanAllah. Oh, that's, that's an amazing story. I mean, and like you were saying, I mean, it's amazing how long it takes to get to that level. And usually, like you said, like, it takes almost like a conflict. Like, you can be agreeing with people for years and think that you're on the same page. And then come to realize that you haven't actually gotten that intimate access with them, like in a relationship. Uh, that made me want to ask a question about the whole Heba thing, because there's a school of thought, you know, it, maybe we can see those two things as an intention. There's this sort of Heba school of thought, which is that, you know, the imam or the scholar should be a sort of untouchable, sort of on a pedestal or something like that. And then there is the aspect that we were just discussing about being a leader in the community. They, they see your flaws. They know your flaws. And there's a relatability with that sort of humanity. So where's the, where's the balance when it comes to that? Or do you have any thoughts on that? Just kind of popped out of me. I mean, the sunnah uh, is the gold standard, right? Uh, there, I don't try to... I have sort of left that uh, conceptualization of being intentional about setting certain boundaries, not for your sake, but for the sake of what you represent. Like I remember some of the scholars I used to benefit from early on used to say, you don't play sports with your students because if some dude shakes you up and scores a goal on you, that was the example he gave. He goes, he's not going to be able to sort of revere you after that. Uh, and he said, and one of them said, can you imagine if you saw me with my beard? Yeah, mashallah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, licking away at an ice cream cone. You think you'd attend my uh, my mustalah classes anymore? Uh, this was Sheikh Abu Sahal Hawini. Hafidahullah. May Allah give him shifa. And so that stuck with me for a while. That yeah, man, I need to for the sake of what I carry. But after a while, I realized that there's something called you know urf and cultural variables, and also pros and cons. You know, uh, like in the past, even. It was against Heiba to to smile too deeply. You just you're goofy, like you know. Nowadays, there's so much stereotyping that the religious people are the guys that don't smile, and so you know, meeting people with the most cheerful smile ever and trying to you know, induce a smile out of them and all of this, that's huge, right? That that may be contrary to you know to Heiba, uh, according to some scholars, contrary to Murua, right? Chivalry or whatnot, or manliness, but. Back to the gold standard, I think there's a, a beautiful equilibrium the Prophet ﷺ sets for us. You know, uh, being able to say no, right, without being callous. Mm. Um, being able to let people know that there are in fact boundaries and forgive me for that. I mean, having haya is what the Prophet ﷺ had. He was like shy from telling people they've overstayed their welcome. Right. 
But at the same time, Allah then said, and Allah does not have hayat from the truth. He's mm -hmm. gonna, he's gonna say the truth. And so that was a lesson even for the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and leaders after him. Mm -hmm. Like when people say, I really, really need you, Shaykh. Sometimes I have to say, you know, I'm all yours, but at this time. So right. you still wanna be considerate of people and accommodating, but set boundaries or else you won't be doing them or yourself a favor, yeah. right? Yeah. I need you, sure, but I do have I have 30 minutes, forgive me, or else I'm going to be violating someone else's rights. Mm -hmm. So to ease them into it, I think, is is important. And then there's certain just conduct. Like, I, I think one of my flaws that I could even just, it's easy for me to be agreeable. I'm maybe too agreeable. Guilty. Yeah. <laughs> Guilty as charged as well. Yeah, avoiding conflict, that's another one. I, I... But there's certain forms of this that are contrary to the sunnah. I mean... Uh, laughing out loud i th i was think i've been thinking about that recently i mean i try to laugh at everyone's jokes and you know and it's not hard i mean you just sort of like the fact that you tried to make me laugh is, is good enough um but then it's like yeah but the prophet ﷺ would not be boisterous in his laugh and so that's auto heba right that you sort of you have this you know elegant smile to yourself or you're not you know exuding so much uh, volume or, there's beauty there right uh, your pace as you walk and the likes. I mean, it's a lifelong project. We'll never reach there, but there's a reason why Allah inscribed it in the Quran and Surah Luqman and elsewhere, right? Even our stride, even our volume. If, uh, it's just a matter of embodying the sunnah that we are teaching people. That will automatically, and then a huge part of that is what's in here. Allah Azza wa just places it. Don't reach for it necessarily with as much intentionality. Even though we understand the scholars who mention that you know, people of knowledge should be distinguished for the sake of facilitating uh, people's recognition of them. Even Aisha, radiallahu anha, like, uh, I remember a scholar saying on the hadith in Sayyid Muslim, when Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, radiallahu anha, had so much haiba of her that he, uh, he said, listen, I, I have a question about the ghusl, you know, from marital relations, how to bathe, but I'm like really embarrassed, right? Uh, and that's great. You should sort of have feel a little bit uh, uncomfortable. We don't want to shatter that. And so she said, Selni fa innama ana ummuk. Ask me, I am your mother. I am like your mother, the mother of the believers. So he asked her the question, like when it's actual uh, intercourse, but this, then that, do we bathe or not? Uh, she said, Ala al khabiri saqat. You've landed on the expert. And. Uh, meaning herself. And so the Dr. Muhassan Abdul Ghaffar, when he said that, he said, how arrogant only an ignorant person would say that. <laughs> so he sort of like put us through a roller coaster. He goes, how arrogant, right? Only a fool would say that. She wanted to make sure the deen was not lost. So she's telling him, make no mistake about it. I laid in the same bed with the Prophet Sallallahu if I don't know this fact, if I'm not the most qualified about it. She said, if she did not present herself that way, you could ask someone who's less qualified. And then the deen and its sacred truths uh, would be crowded with opinions and hearsay and the democratization, right, of knowledge. So understandable, and we certainly respect that view. And I don't think it's like, a, we don't wanna create that false dichotomy. There's a middle balance, look for the gold standard, the Prophet ﷺ, incorporate the fact that there's cultural variables, then the whole, not, it won't all get chalked up to semantics, but a lot of it is resolved after that. Right, mashallah. So you mentioned about how, you know, one of the things that drew you to Allentown was the management and sort of things that you saw there. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about institutions. Let's talk about your experience with the Masajid, maybe in the city or where you were before. And what was it that really, really struck you about Allentown? What's Allentown doing that every masjid in America has to be doing? Um, and what are some challenges that maybe that Allentown has struggled with as an institution? We need to know. We need to be able to benefit from, from others. Those who care the most listen the best. I think it's a worthy principle. Uh, that you don't want to just tell yourself, I did my best, right? Uh, you don't want to just sedate your conscience or whatnot. You don't just want to like hit a bullseye, as they say, on the wrong target. Uh, listening to the needs of the people is extremely important. Like in Allentown, we're not a very wealthy community, 
الحمد لله we're well to do but not an affluent community uh, the operating budget is is like not in the millions like other masajid and stuff just yet uh, it's right there uh, about to to break you know a million this year inshallah but it hasn't been hard at all to collect money uh, I'll be honest and I think a big part of that and this is like a rule I, I've learned from uh, you know those who developed mega churches and you know successful churches that are not mega churches and otherwise they say the golden rule in fundraising is that if you want uh money ask for an opinion right uh ask for advice and if you want advice ask for money <laughs> uh You know, if you're always just asking for money, oh, why don't you guys do this? Why aren't you thinking about that? And how about this? And and some of them are actually be, uh, be pretty well-guided advice and useful. But the idea is cultivating your donors, right? Like, I, I don't mean it's all about the bottom line, right, and the bucks. But every masjid, you know, being a, a, a religious institution, for the most part, that is playing catch-up, against a, a, a growing community at a rapid pace and all these other challenges and Islam being an afterthought for a lot of us in this first and second generation, the, we're all strapped for money. So I'm saying even if your bottom line is money, right? You got to get the buy-in from your stakeholders. Where do they want to be? What do they see? And I think the receptiveness of the management uh, and their, I guess, uh, ability to listen Uh, to the needs of the community. We poll the community a lot, alhamdulillah, and we survey them a lot, and we bring them in and you know offer the utmost transparency as best we can, uh, and layers of that. That's a big part of it. Um, t taking you know valid constructive criticism on the chin also. Uh, it's hard. It's hard. Easier said than done. A brother came to me and said to me, who's now currently a board member, he said to me, Muhammad, where's the youth? I said, I don't know. You tell me where the youth are. He said, the youth are on social media. He said, why is the message not on social media? It's a no-brainer. They don't come here. You go there. Of course, there needs to be caveats here, right? If, if everyone just pivots to social media, then we empty the message, right? If the sheikh's always at the beach, they're going to come to the beach. The people in the <laughs> message are going to come to the beach to hear his lecture over there, right? That was a great analogy. Someone who was very frustrated with social media said to me. Uh, but social media as an intake method into the masajid, you can find me here because I'm I'm truly you know uh, you know at peace with my position about online dawah. It's the ROI on it is this big, right? It's extremely useful momentarily, but masjid orientation is where everything's at. Right. I think anyway. you and I are very much on the same page with that. Yeah. Uh, in fact, Allah humbled me through our social media because when I first came to Utica, I was like, forget it, I don't want to be on YouTube. I don't want to be on, I have an online presence. I want to real people, real relationships, brick and mortar, stuff like that. And then COVID. And then we started just throwing anything online and then it picked up traction. And I was like, I was like, yeah, well, okay, well this can bring in people too. And that's something that, you know, has been really interesting for us because regionally we have actually a lot of people that even just pass through Utica And be like, yeah, like the first thing I saw, or converts, yeah. you know, that are so out in the sticks. So there's its value, right? Right, exactly. And so it was, it was humbling for me because I thought I had a, I had a, you know, a principled stance against it, um, and there was a little bit more nuance there than I think I was initially willing to admit. No, no, Allah bless you and bless your team, and you've really elevated the discourse, and I think you're using it well, and may Allah continue to give you guidance upon your guidance, all of you, and reward you in ways that only He can. And so He said to me, "Why aren't you on social media?" And I said, you're absolutely right. Can you help? He said, this is not about social media. <laughs> He said, this is about technology. He said, we're in the year, let's say, you know, 2018 or whatnot. He said, can you imagine anything respectable functioning without a tech stack? He goes, I'm not going to tell you a hospital in this day and age. A Dunkin' Donuts. Can you imagine a Dunkin' Donuts staying above water without accepting credit cards? And I was like, ouch, you're absolutely right. Yeah. You know, so being able to, to just accept that uh, it just needs a receptive ear. It's like, it's not a, you know, a genius fix. And just you put the right people in the right places and you, you listen to them. Uh, 
uh, I think that's one of the biggest strengths of of the uh, the management there at Allentown. I love less than for it. And, awesome. But it, humility, right? Yeah, it's attitude, but but it's also operational, right? It's like it has to be. You can have the right attitude, but it has to be operationalized with something. So you guys do surveys, and you guys like what what else are you doing in, in order to get that? Um, because one of the interesting things that I'm always looking at you and picking your brain, I see Utica is very similar to Allentown in the fact that it's not an affluent community. We've got a lot of people who just came here. Technology is not something that everybody is comfortable using or is their first sort of thing. A lot of stuff gets spread word to mouth, you know. So uh, what's what are the different sort of ways that you're able to get in feedback and, and listen and poll and whatever, you know, given the various sorts of positions that people are at? I mean, we try to track uh, at events uh, after Juma at times. We have like a Mentimeter, for instance, if you're looking for specific examples. So you only have their attention for 30 seconds. It's their lunch break. You got to respect that. Uh, that's actually one of the things we did. We shortened the Juma because let's be practical here, right? You got an hour lunch break, driving to, driving from, hearing the khutbah, grabbing a quick bite on the way out, on the way back to work. And so we shortened the Juma. And every once in a while, you know, you'll have a Mentimeter, which is, hey, everyone just, you know, point point your, your phones at this barcode and, you know, pick yes, no, best day for an evening class. Or, you know, how are you feeling about this service or that service? When would you prefer um, annual or biannual town hall? And it has come a long way, right? So we pulled them online. We pulled them in-house. We pulled them at, at events. Um, and we try to also collect data to be data-driven even in terms of who is interacting with us, who's registering with us, who's attending what events, how far are they, how close are they, what's the age groups, what's the, what's the gender breakdown, uh, to be as systematic as possible. I mean, stepping up the game with sophistication, it doesn't require a lot of money, actually. There's a lot of people out there that are doing this for Fortune 500 companies that could be in your masjid. Give them room to thrive. You know, Put people where, where they're good at. No need to reinvent the wheel. Give the bread to its baker. So these are volunteers? So much of it is volunteer. You know, we're still year in, year out. We're trying to add one more like dedicated staff member uh, to really up the game because we do feel the growing pains, the rapid growth. Uh, we feel like that six foot three, nine year old who's like painting at the joints, trying to run before he can, you know, fully balance himself out and walk. It's a bad analogy. You can walk at nine, but you understand. I got you. Appreciate you. Yeah, <laughs> it's almost midnight. Yeah, no, it's been a lot. No, that's that's really really important. Um, you know, listening is an attitude, taking the time, and I think what you just said, empowering people with skills to get involved in a meaningful way. And obviously, the greatest I think example we have of that is the Prophet Ali Sallam. Like when you want to look at leadership, like we were saying, putting people in the right role to succeed, and then not micromanaging them, not, you know, like making them feel empowered. You don't hire okay. a smart person and tell them what to do. Exactly. You, you know, you actually, yeah, you, you brought them on to let them, here's the keys, go take this thing and, and let's see what you can do with it. Right. And then the proof's in the pudding at the end of the day. And someone can also easily say, yeah, but you don't want, you know, to, to rock the boat and too much too fast. And I'm not saying these are intended as excuses, but nine times out of 10 people are well-intentioned, Right. Uh, that can't be your rule. That is the challenge. Like a lot of the big masajid have big masajid problems, they call them. It's red tape issues because you sort of are overprotective of your baby, but the baby gets malnourished now. And so you just start chopping down on all service, all activity, all programming out of fear of, you know, there being conflict or be something being derailed or hijacked. But that's not a healthy move. Like graveyards are peaceful. That doesn't mean it's it's alive, right? Yeah, you need to shake things up and, and you know. You got to leave room for thoughtful, respectful, dissenting voices, mm -hmm. all of that. Yeah, subhanAllah. Any other thoughts about, about community life? What else, in addition to management and listening and things like that, what else is Allentown doing that you think other masajids should be doing? And if nothing comes to mind, then maybe what are some pain points or some challenges that you face that um, that keep you up at night? I mean, the truth is that Pew's numbers and Isna's numbers, they're all comparable that 80% of the Muslim community on average has never set foot in the masjid. 80%? Yeah. Allahu Akbar. I can do the math if you want. Subhanallah, I, I trust you, but I've never heard of that stat before. <laughs> yeah, think about it. Like 4 million Muslims uh, in America, roughly 2,500 masajid, just to keep the math simple. 
That's 1,600 Muslims per masjid. 1,600 Muslims per masjid. What masjid holds 600 Muslims? That means those people that show up at Eid and you'd be like, yeah, where you been all year and all that stuff. Even you include those, that's your max capacity of your masjid. What is the max capacity? Where's the rest of the... Actually, you know what? When I think of Utica specifically, that makes a lot of sense because we have so many Muslims that are just like hiding, like, you know, they're everywhere. But the masjid is an entirely different thing. Prophet ﷺ also said that it's not poverty. I fear for you. I fear for you for the. I fear for you that the dunya open up in front of you, and you start competing in it like they competed in it. Those before you destroys you like it destroyed them, and so the immigration to America. And of course, we are not overlooking the African American community who's been here and done a very impressive job. And there's so much we can learn from them. Uh, forget my own personal, you know, experiences. Uh, they're already one third of the Muslim community, uh, roughly speaking. But you know, the other two thirds, self-selected group of privilege, is only here because you could afford to be here, and you came here for the dunya. You came here for the university or for the job offer, or the hospital. Then Islam was an afterthought, and playing catch up for most of them was impossible. Like you show up here, and then you're like, "Hey, wait a minute, how do I do this Juma thing?" Nearest masjid, eleven hours, right? Then you finally grab four, five, ten like-minded folks, and you little house on the prairie. And then you're trying to build it out a little further. Oh, snap, my kids are 15, 16. And like, then it's a whole generation now to build out an Islamic school and then how, how well resourced will that school even be and real costs, right? And so the advice in general is that this is a matter of kufr and iman. This is a matter of, you know, Islam's been in many of our families for 1400 years, roughly speaking. We don't want to be on the Day of Judgment, that generation that sends us forward. It was fumbled. And fumbled is a light word for the gravity of the subject. Uh, may Allah help us all, you know, put whatever is necessary on the table and put aside whatever we need to put aside to walk people back from the edge of this cliff. I mean, the masajid are like the Ark of Nuh, alayhi salam. If people don't come in, you will not be able to swim through these these waves, these storms, it's impossible. And so it's really about whatever it takes. You know, it's not about even how good you are. It's you know, like how bad you want it, that sense of urgency. No, it's true. And when you see, you know, kids uh, missing Sunday school or meshi programs for karate or for sports or whatever, you see the priorities. And that's something that I try to drill home uh, in Utica is that parents communicate priorities to the youth through every decision you make. What, what wins out, what loses out. We're a successful community. Right? Like what, we're 1% of the population and maybe 2%, 3%, 4% of the doctors and engineers, right? Because we emphasize that. We prioritize that, as you said, perfectly. One thing I forgot to ask you about. I, one of the other things that I really appreciate about what goes on in Allentown is the collaboration between the Masajid. I think that is a model that other cities have to replicate. Can you talk a little bit about the sort of relationships that you have with, you know, you've got Imam Daniel there. You got Imam Yahya Rodus, you know, you've got, and uh, anybody who is thinking categorically would be like, wait a second, what are these guys doing? You've got the Sufi masjid over here and the this other masjid over here. Lots of cities in America, they would not be collaborating at all. And yet somehow in Allentown, you figured out a way to make it work and to do a lot of beautiful things together. Maybe comment on that a little bit and what do you attribute that to and, and how can other communities learn from what you guys are doing? May Allah protect me from overconfidence, Yanni, but it has just become like preposterous for me to think that we're at a stage where we have the luxury to disunite, right? Uh, we should be uniting even with non-Muslims for the common good and the greater good. So how about people that have variant, uh, you know, understandings of Islam? Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, al birri wa taqwa. Cooperate people in goodness and in piety. Uh, and especially when it comes to like some of the groups you mentioned, it, it is, you know, if anyone is in their right mind and they understand the stakes, you know, people tell me, you know, there's like a bid'ah this and a bid'ah that. I'm like, I want this person to die an innovator and not die a disbeliever. If those are my only two options. If I chase people away from that, they're not coming to me. They're going somewhere else. 
they're getting sucked into the, the abyss, right? And so don't you dare try to bring up these divisive topics. You know, if anyone thinks that anyone on that spectrum is, you know, you consider them deviant, are they more deviant than the Khawarij? <laughs> who called the most righteous people on the face of the earth, the most righteous person on the face of the earth at the time, Uthman. And then again, that same classification for Ali, called them disbelievers. How did the Sahaba treat them, right? Like, you know, when they laid siege to Uthman's house, I find this narration, Sahih Bukhari, so important. A man came to him and said to him, and they've laid siege to his house. They're about to assassinate him. May Allah be pleased with him. They, he said to him, Anta Imam Amma, you're the big Imam. Okay, and I pray behind an imam of fitna, one of these people causing political turmoil, meaning the imam of my local neighborhood masjid is Khariji. He calls you kafir. He said, and like, we're, we don't know what to do. What do we do? Uthman radiallahu an said, salah is the best thing that people do. So when people are doing good, do good with them. No such thing as walking out on your local imam. Uh, and yes, there is some fiqhi nuance there about like if then pros, cons, calculus and stuff, but these are all like red herrings in our context. What's actually happening is that I don't get you know some fiqhi opinion in the masjid my way, and so I'm gonna go yeah, start yeah. another masjid. You can't tell me Imam Ahmad wouldn't sit with an innovator. Like, you're not Imam Ahmad, neither am I. <laughs> Who said sitting or playing basketball together is an endorsement or collecting clothes for Turkey after an earthquake is an endorsement, right? And, and you know, so he said, prepare yourself to do right when people are doing right, do right with them. And when they do evil, you abstain. So even what we perceive as evil, right? Even respecting, I'm not even going to call it evil because I don't believe that, right? For the most part, the vast majority of things are within the realm of excusable difference. And so respecting each other's sensitivities, like some of these imams you mentioned have not really, you know, spoken at my masjid ever. And I haven't spoken at their masjid ever out of respecting the sensitivities of their base. Why would I come ruffle feathers and then he has to live with that or vice versa, right? And we totally understand that, alhamdulillah. You know, on the personal level, we have that relationship. We're trying to find the common good, collaborate on as much as possible and let certain disputes, you know, be be settled by the king of the world, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe we find out that some of us were more right than others. Maybe we find out that we were all rewarded, some more than others, even in the moments we were mistaken. And we believe that a lot of this is between the realm of rewardability and, and forgivability, inshallah. I think a lot of people don't realize that, you know, the shaitan doesn't care which side he takes you down on. And so the shaitan can take you down with sort of um, extreme laxity or with... Um, you know, extreme oversensitivity to these issues. And a lot of people are motivated by guilt or a sense of, you know, uh, zeal, misplaced zeal, right, when it comes to these issues. And I'm glad you said what you said because in their mind, you know, the narrative is that these people are doing something wrong. But people who study even just a little bit realize that this is all, you know, in the specific communities that we're talking about, it's all within, you know, what's acceptable. But still, you know, we're at a, on the topic of unity, you know, we're, we're, unity is, uh, is a rare thing, unfortunately. You know, I think that most cities in the United States, the multiple masajid, I know I can speak for our experience in Utica, don't have very much collaboration when it comes to programming or rotating khutbahs, if, if that would be a desirable thing or, or anything, let alone financial programs, anything, right? Um, and I think we need to be a louder voice when it comes to showing that this is actually the way forward. And like you said, you know, um, that's Noah's Ark, right? All of us in a community in Allentown, all of us in Utica with our various different dispositions coming together to share some programs and some things once in a while and whatever, read prayers, you know, like this is, this is an ark. And if you don't have that, you're really just holding on to a plank, no, right? No, no, no. SubhanAllah. Do you have any uh, final words, final comments, you know, things you'd like to share before we wrap up? I mean, just for all the leaders out there, uh, I know Masajid are bleeding talent left and right. And I know there's a systemic, uh, you know, infrastructural uh, impediment or like <laughs> mayhem that uh, sort of incentivizes for them that. But... Masajid need to be religiously informed institutions, 
right? The social element is so important. But at the end of the day, uh, bingo night has not kept the churches full, right? There has to be more substance than that. A place of, of repose, a sanctuary from, you know, uh, the ills of modern society. Uh, this crash course that we're on as like a civilizational trajectory right now. And people are hurting. People are in pain. People are confused. Uh, and we have the answer. At the end of the day, we have the answer. Uh, and so just, you know, buckling down into Masajid, I know it's hard. <laughs> I know it's it's painful. But I would say fight for it. Fight for it. If I can invoke Bruce Lee's The Art of Fighting Without Fighting, right? Fight for it without hostility. Because if there's going to be hostility, you may as well open your own masjid. And there's, I, I showed you the stats. We're short on, on space, right? Square footage. Open your own masjid. But fight, you know, your shaitan. Fight yourself. You know, push back so long as it will not destroy the bare minimum, which is the social cohesion, right? Fight to make things better. Yes, we cannot accept, you know, uh, this uh, infancy. Uh, communal infancy that we're in now and we have to do better uh, but don't just walk away you, there's still a lot we can offer uh, and we pray that Allah shorten the learning curve for us all I mean, I mean, at all. well that's that's a wonderful reflection and thank you so much for joining us I mean this is just like a normal everyday conversation between <laughs> except that it's midnight <laughs> except that it's midnight <laughs> so just for the the obligatory p p random podcast question what's one thing that people don't know about you. What's one thing people don't know about me? I almost killed everybody in the masjid. Case. I got to build the suspense. You really want to know? I gotta... Yeah, yeah. That's that's. I think you just hit the the teaser for the whole video, right? <laughs> My daughter's aqiqa had way too much meat, right? It wasn't in the masjid. And it was like a fasting season. I forget if it was like Dhul Hijjah or Muharram or something, but like there, the people were breaking fast in the masjid the next day. So I brought all of the unopened trays of meat uh, over from the Aqiqa to the masjid, froze it, heated it the next day. Apparently, like just the trip over, food poisoning, and like day after day, this like really good sisters, like her two baby girls are in the hospital. I was like, oh no, why? That's crazy. Then his other brother's like, yeah, my three daughters are just like <laughs> heads in the toilet. <laughs> and this, and by the way, before Imam Tom Fakini's podcast, nobody connected these dots or knows about Allah, these really, it's an exclusive, outside of my head. It's an so you, you, you get your money's worth on this one. How many years ago? Your daughter's aqiqa must have been you know, several years ago, huh? Yeah, this was Naila's aqiqa, so about three years ago. Okay. Sheikh, so I cannot explain to you uh, what I was going through. You, you must know, have felt horrible. Yeah, Rabbi. Oh. Ghafrallah, Dak. I mean, I mean, so... <laughs> That's a fun fact about <laughs> Shinawi. <laughs> They're all gold. better now. And they Nobody forgiven, died. No fatalities. They've forgiven me, but they don't actually know how many others besides themselves. Right. They thought maybe their plate had like a, a bad uh, lamb chop in it or something. SubhanAllah. That's a surprising problem at Masajid social functions like that, that don't have actual like temperature control and like, you know, like restaurant style sort of control. It was actually the... Uh, the food was mm. sitting in the car uh. Uh, and we thought sort of the temperature was good enough. Right. And then the, that day of Aqiqa plus the drive all the way back to Allentown, it was uh, optimism bias, bias for sure. Allah forgive us and, and reward them all. Um, yes. Well, thank you so much again. May Allah bless you and your um, community and your family. And, uh, you know, always look forward to more conversations. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Shalom wa ta'ala 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 wa ta'